Thank you, choir, for singing that. Pray now. Amen. Good to have you here today. Thank you for coming. If if you are here, that means that you're not on spring break, all right? So uh, we're glad to see you this morning because we guys a lot of empty chairs because we have a lot of folks that are gone this week. Um, they are um, gone on spring break for a few days because school is out. And so um, I'm glad that you're here today uh, to help us continue on uh, this morning uh, looking at who's your one. Um, before we get started, um, let me just uh, let you know that uh, we have um, spent the weekend um, with boys. Okay, as you know, I have girls. Okay, and so boys are a little different. So uh, we we got to spend the weekend with some boys. Um, Zach and his guys came up and played uh, for uh, for that. And uh, they did a great job. And uh, but we're just not used to boys, okay? And so um, you know we're we're uh, there for uh, there to worship and and to learn things. And so we have this activity that they get to do, and it's all about uh, missions. It's all about learning a, a foreign country and doing a a game as well. And so. We have all kinds of things like Israel, and one of the guys will read some facts about Israel, and they had to take a slingshot and try to knock down this giant seven-foot Goliath with a bell on top, you know, and try to hit the bell. Most of them couldn't even hit the board, even though the bell, all right? Uh, and, and so one of mine was, was mine was uh, they had a, 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 a pit stop, kind of like, and it was a flat tire. And so we had this big old piece of rubber, and they all had to get inside, and they had to walk on this rubber uh, to fix their flat, flat tire. And one of the young boys that, that I had, um, halfway through, he said, I'm, I'm tired of this. This is too hot out here. I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm still long sleeve. I'm not sweating. I'm not working hard here. I'm, I'm okay. He said, man, it's just too hot. And I said, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, this is a young kid, young boy. I said, I'm going to try to teach him a lesson. I said, what are you, you going to do when you get older and you have a job outside? You know, I was thinking with this great answer, you know. He simply came back and said, I'll sweat. All right, so. So uh, it, it's a little different for us handling boys than it is girls. Uh, and so, but uh, we had like 150 boys and men that we were, uh, ministering to for the last couple of days, and and so we, we're just trying to get a hold of that, and so so being around boys is quite different than it is girls. Okay, I can tell you that right now. And so, uh, but we had a good time, and uh, we love love being able to do that. I'm glad that you're here. That means that you're not on spring break, which may be bad on your case. All right, but it may be good. You may be saving some money as well. Right, and uh, for some of you. Uh, I know you're saying I'm too old for spring break. That's okay. You're in retirement. That's kind of like spring break for a long time. And so uh, we, we hope that you're enjoying that um, as well. And so uh, we're just thankful that you're here today, and we're going to continue um, our series. And before before I go any further, I want you to think about this. And so I'm going to ask you a question. And as soon as I ask you a question, I'm going to ask you to give me an answer right off the top of your head. Okay? And so think about what I'm ready to say, and then give me your quickest answer. Uh, what is the first disciple name that comes to your to your mind? Okay. I guess you're all on spring break too. You didn't answer. All right. Uh, you're not quick enough. I heard a few answers. Okay. I heard a few answers. Uh, tend, we tend to think a lot uh, about the disciples that did a lot um, because we see their names throughout the pages, and so. I want to continue on this morning looking at one particular uh, disciple of this morning. And uh, so if you'll stay with me this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 1, verses 55 or 35 uh, through 42. And uh, again, this is, this is what we're reading. It says, The next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus, then Jesus turned and saw them following and saying to them, What seek ye? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is also being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
one of the two which heard John speak and followed him, and Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, he first findeth his own brother Simon, and saying to him, We have found the Messiah, which has been interpreted the Christ. And being brought to him to Jesus, when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation a stone. I want to, to have us look this morning on this thought on I can be one. I can be one. Okay, Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for the day that you've given us. Speak to our hearts today. We ask that you would just watch over us, guide us, and direct us and in through your word today and that we may come out understanding your word, being um, uh, excited about your word, Lord, putting your word deep down in our heart and allow it to begin to take root as we've just saw in the last several weeks. We ask, Lord, that you would just use our hearts and our minds today as we just take a few moments to open and unpack your word. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, we started out looking at this on Who's Your One. We started out by thinking about uh, the importance of one. And we started last Sunday with the life of John the Baptist coming on the scene. And we noticed that John was the only one of our four Gospels that proclaimed Jesus as the Lamb of God. Peter and Paul also mentioned Jesus as the Lamb, but it's just John who really drills this down for us. The statement was significant and important because we understand that through the preaching of John the Baptist, that this is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who, he said, would take the sin uh, of the world upon himself. We also looked at the instructions of the Lord last week as they pertain to meeting people one-on-one. -on -one. How Jesus would just go on and share that type of ministry one-on-one -on -one with people about the mission of his coming which was eternal life through repentance. And so we, we looked at how the Lord had done that as well. Then we looked at the intentionality of Jesus as he went to build relationships with many cultural different individuals for the sake of salvation. Now we know that the Bible says that he primarily came for those in Israel, and we understand that. But Jesus also crossed that and culturally met with different individuals to tell them about his purpose and how they could have a relationship. Remember the woman, the Samaritan at the well? Different ones that Jesus would encounter along the way. And all this was done uh, because of the one that we look at even today, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning we want to turn our attention to the effect of this one, who we call Jesus, in the life of Andrew. Now, I would su suspect that Andrew was one of the thousands that had met Christ in throughout this whole time. Every person that met Christ would come away with some decision on what they or who they thought Jesus was. And we see that through the scriptures. Remember Jesus asked them, who do the people think I am? Everybody had a thought about who Jesus was. And so Andrew was one of many thousands, but Andrew would begin to understand who the Lord was that day. The same effect is still seen today. Everyone who comes in contact with Jesus will have to decide one way or the other if he's the Lamb of God, or if he's just another man. If he's just another guy who come up on the scene with a story to tell. With this in mind, I want us to look at the life of Andrew just for a moment this morning. And when we come to the end of our time together, I want to ask you this question. Can I be the one? Can I be the one? As we look at the life of Andrew. First thing I want us to see this morning through the scriptures is the complete honesty of Andrew. In the life of Andrew, we notice that at the moment of the reading of the scripture, Andrew, Andrew is a follower of John the Baptist. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist who was baptized by John and was the speaker of, of, of the truth, and we know that. And so we understand that Andrew, who followed with John, was a guy who sought the truth out. And he wanted to know, he wanted to be a seeker of the truth. So keep in mind what I told you uh, that last week when John the Baptist had encountered with the religious folks, he told them he was not Christ. And because people wondered who he was, and John said, no, I'm not Christ, I'm not the Messiah, he is coming. I, I know he's coming, and, and he's talking about that. And he said, the one that I see coming, John said, I'm not even worthy to unlatch the shoes upon his feet. That's how important that he is. So the day had arrived and that Jesus had came up onto the scene, and John pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. 
And when Jesus spoke that day, Andrew knew that this one who John said was the Lamb of God was different. He was saying things that he had never heard before in such a way. And so the words of Christ that day was different from the religious leaders. And even to John's message. And John even said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Because of what the two disciples heard, they were standing there and they heard that Jay, what Jesus had said. And, and, and because of this, it changed their lives immediately. We also took a moment to overlap those events that took place with the following of Jesus. You know, the moment of these two disciples, they, they just said, you know what? This guy's different. John said, this is the Lamb of God. We've heard him speak. And immediately, as, as the Lord began to depart the area, two disciples began to follow him. One of them was Andrew. Jesus saw them and asked him the question, what seek ye? Wanting to know what were they seeking? What were they seeking out of life? They already knew this man was different. And so Jesus turned around and said, what seek you? And they, 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 he wanted to know, what are you seeking out in life? And you know what? They could, just like us, they could have probably answered that question a hundred different ways. They could have started out and said, hey, you know what? This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for some riches in this life. They could have thought about that and they could have thought some of the answers and some would have said, you know what? I, I'm looking for a better form of government. Hey, can you help us with that? We're under a Roman siege, and we really don't like being on the a Roman authority. Man, I'd love to have a different type of government. They, they could have said, you know what? We know that there's no one following you yet. And then, of course, you know this comes to play later on. They could have said, hey, can we be the president and vice president of your fan club? Hey, we would really like to be a part of this. Can we do that? So there's a lot of things they could have said. Of what all they could say, they asked the Lord this. Where dwellest thou? Now that was a great request, wasn't it? <laughs> he said, what are you seeking out in life? And they turn around and they ask, where are you staying? Now if we were to ask people today what they would seek from the Lord, I guarantee you many of them at all would hardly ever say, Lord, where are you dwelling? Because where you're dwelling, I want to be. The disciples answered from their heart, right? That, that's what they wanted at the time is to know where the Lord was staying so that they could come and sit at His feet to learn from Him. That's what they wanted. Jesus told them to come and to see. And they did. In due time, through Scriptures, we see that Andrew, who followed the Lord, was willing to put everything behind him to follow Jesus. Here's what I want you to see out of the honesty out of the life of Andrew. He was convinced that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And we read that in verse 41 when he goes and he tells his brother in all honesty, he says, we have found the Messiah. That's the honesty of Andrew's heart this morning. Can you honestly say that you have found the Messiah? The second thing I want us to look at is that we see the um, hegemony of Andrew. The word hegemony is from the Greek word hemogemini, which means leadership or leading by the way. See, I have to dig really deep to find rhyming words sometime, okay? So I had to go really deep to find this word, hegemony, all right? You ought to pat me on the back for that one. It took a while. But it means leading or leading by the way, okay? I want you to understand that we see this in the leading comes in the verses that we've already read this morning. Andrew was so excited to know with all honesty that he had found the Messiah that he leads in sharing these findings with his brother. The moment that Andrew heard Jesus speak, he knew that this was totally different than anything he's ever heard. And at that moment, he decided when he took those steps to follow Christ, that it meant something different. It meant that it was an invitation 
for him to come and sit at the master's feet or with the master. Andrew could not hold all that excitement to himself, so he shared it with his brother. So Andrew brings Simon. He introduces him to Jesus. And if you could just picture the moment, it may have went something like this. Andrew says, Jesus, I would like to introduce to you my brother Simon. I have told him how I knew that I have found the Messiah, the Christ, which we have longed for so long. As soon as Andrew done his done speaking, the Lord just turns and he looks at Simon and he says, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. Could you imagine Simon just really thinking, how does this guy know all of this? Thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation, a stone. What an introduction, right? Simon brings his, I mean, Andrew brings his brother Simon to the Lord and says, Lord, I want to introduce you to my brother. And the Lord turns to him and says, I know who he is. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to change his name to begin with to match what he will do in the future. And so we see this leading. And I I want you to think about this for a moment. If Andrew was not willing to lead Simon to Jesus, would we not have a Peter in the midst of our story? Let me give you a couple of other places where we see Andrew leading in the way through scriptures. You would call the story, which has been given to us, to the message, uh, that there was over 5,000 men alone, not counting the women and children. And Jesus, knowing the time of the day, the circumstances of the people, the Lord introduced uh, what they would have in the future, but he, he, he said, listen, they can't go home. He says, let's just have them all sit down in companies and, and let them sit on the grass, and I'm going to feed them. And like many of us, if we had been there, we would also have done exactly what the Scriptures say the disciples were doing, especially Philip, who knew there was something, nothing of sufficient around to feed so many. So we read in the Bible from John 6, 8 and 9, and one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saying to him, there's a lad here that had five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Okay. He didn't have all the answers. But I want you to see how Andrew is leading. Philip says, I don't think there's anything here. There's nothing out here. There's no drive through There's no Chick-fil-A, Lord. We can't feed these people. I'm sorry. But Andrew leads in the way. He quietly goes out and he finds his little lad. And he says, Lord, I have found someone. Doesn't have a lot of food. I don't know what you can do with it. But I did find somebody. He's leading the way for the Lord. Of course, we know what happens, right? By the leading of the way, what happens? The Lord takes that small amount of food, He blesses it, and He's able to feed thousands of people and have leftovers because of Andrew leading along the way. On another occasion, we find in John chapter 12, some Greeks that had come to worship at the feast and they had come to see Jesus. Again, we find Philip. uh, They come to Philip first and say, hey, You're one of the disciples. We're Greeks. We want to talk to Jesus. Philip doesn't have an answer again. Poor Philip. He doesn't seem to always have an answer. But what's he do? He goes to Andrew. The Bible says that he went to Andrew. And the Bible says that in confidence, Andrew, we read in John chapter 12, verse 22, that Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. The result was Andrew thought it was important enough to bring the instruct, in introductions of the Greeks to Jesus. And we continue to read. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. So Andrew leads Philip and they go and they tell Jesus. But why is this so important that Andrew would help lead Philip and, 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 and them to this information to Jesus? Well, the Lord had just entered Jerusalem, if you'll recall, on a donkey. And people were excited and they had put down the palm branches and they put down their garments and they were singing these praises and they were singing Hosanna to the Lord. And and, and we see all this taking place. But prior to that, the Scriptures give us the heart of some of those people that was there. And in John chapter 12, verse 19, we read that the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Receive ye how... You prevail nothing. Behold, the world has gone mad after him. 
So as Jesus is coming into town, the, these Pharisees are saying, man, this whole world, this whole, this whole group of people have gone mad after this man called Jesus. And here, all of a sudden, these Greeks come, and they want to talk to Jesus. They want to know something more about him. They already are believers, but they want to know more about him. They come to Philip. Philip says, man, I don't know what to do. He goes to Andrew. Andrew says, yes, I think it's important. Come, you guys, and we're going to introduce you to Jesus. He's leading the way. And it was important because Jesus went on to say this in verses twelve, uh, in, ch- in chapter 12 of John, verses 23 through 26. He answered them, he says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it biteth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hated his life in this world shall keep it unto the life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me and where I am. There shall my servant be. If any man serve me, he will my father honor. They brought him to Jesus, and Jesus said, Here, I'm going to tell you something about me. And I want you to listen. And I want you to understand that some of history repeats to us that Andrew has been referred to one of the first four missionaries because of the Greeks he brought to Jesus. And his leading them to where Jesus was. So we find Andrew being a leader or leading the way. The third thing I want us to see this morning is to take a look at the humility of Andrew. I want us to take a deep look into the heart of Andrew just for a moment. Andrew is considered the first of the disciples to come to know Jesus. Right? But he never reaches elite status. He never gets there. He was the first, but Andrew was not worried about being first, for Andrew thought more about his service than his reputation. Most of the time when I ask to many of you, who was the first, what's the first disciple that comes to your mind? John, Peter, you know, we, 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 we hit the highlight ones, right? The guys who did a lot. Andrew is very, very seldom spoke of because Andrew's life was in the background exactly where he needed to be. Andrew thought more of the work to be done than the place of status of of being a follower of Christ. We don't see in scriptures, we do not see Andrew preaching to large crowds. We don't see where Andrew wrote words inspired by the Holy Spirit for us to read. Nor do we read about His so-called gifts that are written to amaze us. I mentioned how Andrew, being the first, was actually part of the inner circle. If you go back to Mark chapter 13, you will find that Peter, James, and John you'll find that Andrew's connected with them. And so, while you come to this inner circle of the Lord, here you got these three men who are powerful, and you got Andrew. And so throughout history, we, we often refer to Peter, James, and John as pillars of the church. For all that they said and done, we, pa- we call them pillars of the church. Andrew was no pillar. But he was a humble stone that helped build the church nonetheless. Andrew was content on being a lesser known disciple, understanding the teaching of Jesus that the first shall be last. He understood that. So I want you to see the humility of his heart. How he would allow God to use him in the capacity that he was chosen. Again, could you remind, could you could you remember what could have maybe took took place? Could you imagine the scene if it was just different, if it was more worldly than it was uh, with the heart of Christ? That when Andrew brought his brother Simon to the Lord, and he says, "Lord, I want you to meet my brother Simon," 
And Simon turns to him and says, you'll no longer be called Simon. You'll be called Cephas. You'll become a stone. I'm going to build my church on you. Could you just imagine? Could you just imagine for a moment Andrew melting and having a fit? Oh, come on, Lord, I was first. It ain't fair. Yeah, that's where your kid's at in the grocery store, right? You know what that's like? The meltdown, it's not fair. How can it be that way? You don't love me like you like the rest. You know how it goes. But the humility of Andrew's heart was to serve Christ and to be who God called him to be. I want to take a few moments to look at the bigger picture for us this morning. I want us to see the life of Andrew in our own personal life this morning. Andrew brought one person, his brother Simon, to the Lord because in the honesty of his heart, he knew that he had found Christ, the Messiah, that he had longed for. I'm going to ask this question this morning as I asked last Sunday morning. Who is the last person you introduced to Jesus? Who is the last person you introduced to Jesus? For some of us, it's probably taken our mind to drift. Let me ask the question, who is one person you could introduce to Jesus? Should we not be asking the Lord, Lord, who is it that I can introduce to you. I believe the Lord is still handing out, giving out invitations for people to come and know Him. And we can never introduce one person to the Lord until we're honest. Here we go. Just like Andrew. That we can honestly say that we can present Him as the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord of our life. You can never convince me that you're willing to give someone advice on purchasing something or partaking something unless you're totally sold on the idea. Now, Sarah, Jeremy, your wife, hurt my feelings today. She said that she would not rec- any, recommend anybody to buy a Ford. My mom and dad both work for Ford. That hurt me, all right? So, to be honest, if you go to Sarah and ask her what kind of car to buy, she's not going to recommend a Ford. So don't go to Sarah, all right? What I'm saying is we will not give convincible evidence to someone unless we're sold on that, right? We, I'm going to tell you, you've heard me say this before, and I will continue to say this. If you want to go eat lunch with me, I would love to have you. We'll go to the Mexican restaurant, and we will have lingua. And you know what lingua is, right? Cow's tongue. I am sold on that. And I can convince you that it's good, right, Jonathan? See, he's saying yes. You don't see him, but he's doing this. If you don't believe me, you can ask him after the service. I'm, I'm convinced that cow tongue is the best meat you can eat. Okay? I'm convinced of that. I can sell that to you real easy. Oh, yes. Some of you have already ate it here and you don't know it. All right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm convinced that if you try it, you will love it. I, I, I'm convinced of that, right? Now, if I'm not so convinced of that, I wouldn't even share that with you, right? I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even tell you that. I might say, if you want to eat it at your own risk, go ahead. Because when you're done eating, when you go to lick your lips, it, your tongue may hit up here. I, you know, it grows. Something happens. No. You know, it's just like with Christ. If we're really convinced that He is our Lord of our life, He's Jesus Christ, He's the one who's died for us, we will share Him. Because we know who He is. But if we're not convinced 
we're not honest about who he is, we tend not to give all the facts or to even tell the story. So, so the first thing that we really got to have to to look at in our own life is that we're going to have to be totally convinced that Jesus is the Messiah in all honesty of our heart. So let me ask you, do you really believe in all honesty that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the Christ? The second thing I want us to see that the leading of Andrew can be found in his inner circle of disciples asking the Lord for interpretation. He, he's one of those guys, he's, he's, he's in that. He's in the inner core. He, he's asking questions. You'll find him in the upper room. You're going to find him. And what happens is, Andrew brought just one person to Jesus. And it made a difference, right? He brought... He brought who? Simon, who became Peter, who became a great stone where the church began its building after 3,000 were saved of a message. Just one person that Andrew brought made a difference. Does anybody really know real quick who Edward Kimball is? Edward Kimball. Anybody? Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. Just a Sunday school teacher. As a Sunday school teacher, he, he became a guy who would go out and he would talk to people and, and, and one young man had came to his class and he went to visit him. And, and what happened, he went to, to meet this one young man who, was a, who lived in Boston who was a shoe salesman. And because he shared Christ with this shoe salesman, the fire became so indwelled in this young man that he became one of the world's greatest evangelists named Dwight L. Moody. A man we've never heard of. Teaches Sunday school. Reaches one man called Dwight Moody. After evangelizing America, D.L. Moody started out in England. There in England, Frederick B. Meyer heard the message. So Meyer becomes one who follows Christ. Meyer was inv invited to Furman University to preach. One young fellow in the student body had decided to quit the ministry and go back to a secular job. But he heard the message of Mr. Meyer and was given such fever and flame that the young man stepped out, came forward, renewed his vow to preach the gospel. He's known as Evangelist R.G. Lee. Meyer went on to preach in other locations. In another service, a young man caught fire and began to evangelize. His name, his name uh, was named J. Wilbur Chapman. Then because of Chapman's preaching, he was invited to speak at a certain place. His ministry was changing and he was needing someone to come and help him in the ministry. Mr. Chapman found a man called Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, influenced by Wilbur Chapman, got in the ministry and went to Charlotte, North Carolina. There a group of businessmen got inspired and stirred up, uh, up that they organized a committee to invite evangelists, other evangelists back. One was called Mordecai Ham from Louisville, Kentucky. Mordecai preached in a meeting and Billy Graham came. To salvation. Can you not see how one might make a difference all through people's lives? All this happened because of one man named Edward Kimball. One nobody. One another nobody. And started a series of dominoes falling and ended up with millions acknowledging Jesus as Savior in Moody's ministry. Hundreds of thousands in Meyer's ministry. Hundreds of thousands in Chapman's ministry. Hundreds of thousands in Lee's ministry. And hundreds of thousands more in Graham's ministry. All because one man thought it was important enough to tell someone else about Jesus. We never know what our one person 
that we introduce to Christ will become until we decide to lead that one to Christ. Then I want us to lastly see the humility of Andrew, who has seen lesser role but a stone to help build the church. We must decide today whether we're going to be a stone within the body of the church. No matter what you're doing, no matter how insignificant of the things you, you are or you think you're doing, is not important. Can I just say that probably everyone in this room, unless I'm mistaken, and if I, am, I, if I offend you, I apologize, but I don't think any of us are on the high elite status of the ministry. Matter of fact, I would guarantee you that most of you in this room didn't even know who I was or existed until I showed up here one Sunday to fill in back in December a few years ago. You never even heard of me. I knew a long time ago that all God wanted me to do was to be the best servant I could be in my own capacity. I have talked to guys who actually thought that they, when they got into the ministry, they actually thought that they were going to be the next Billy Graham. And because they thought that they were going to be the next Billy Graham, that they were going to evangelize thousands, that people were going to follow, there's going to be a lot of things happening. Things like that did not happen. And for most of them, it was a great disappointment within the ministry of themselves. Many of them quit. I decided a long time ago that I knew that I would never be a Billy Graham. I knew that I would never have a national platform. I knew that I probably wouldn't even have a regional platform. But God called me to be faithful into a local church and that to be my platform and to do what I could do through the local church of a community in which He set me in. And that has been my ministry. National prominence will never get to me. Unless I'm rested or something. But that is not going to happen. All right. I hope that will never happen. But. But. I'm still called to do what God's asked me to do. Right? Same thing with you. Same thing with you. Some of you will be teaching Sunday school for most of your life. And you'll never be recognized by the world. Some of you will serve in the local church for most of your saved time here on this earth. And most of the world will not even know who you are. And so we have to decide that within ourselves, that our humility is this. It's not about the platform in which we speak. It's about the person who we speak of. That's the most important. And so... In all humility, I want to be, and I hope you would want to be, who God wants you to do, and want me to do, and ask of us to do, so that one day we can stand before Him and hear, well done, thou faithful servant. So I want to ask you this final question. Are you willing to be one? Last week we looked at the importance of one, which is Jesus Christ. This morning I want to ask you the question, are you willing to be one? You say, willing to be one what? Are you willing to be one like Andrew? Who's willing just to go and do what God's called him to do without elite status, with all humility, with all honesty, and to be a leader and lead the way for others? It's a good question, isn't it? Are we, are we willing to do that? So I, I'm really, God has called us. What has God called us to do? God, God has given us the, the challenge, right? The challenge is to go out and to what? Share the gospel, right? The invitation is whether we're going to go out and to share the gospel when we have the opportunity.